I have been converted to the Dune fandom. I mean, seriously, ever since I saw the movie in theaters back in 2021, I have seen both of these movies a collective eight times since they've come out. I have no idea why. I don't have a problem. You're the one with the problem! <clears throat> Anyway, with Dune being as amazing as it is, it only makes sense for other, less amazing movie studios to create their own films to capitalize on the literal cinematic event that we're living through. And our perpetrator here today is the mythical The Asylum. Best known for their cinematic masterpieces Sharknado, or Attack of the Meth Gator. The Asylum is a little bit legendary in the direct-to-video B-movie scene, and in 2021, the same year as the first Dune, The Asylum released Planet Dune, directed by Glenn Campbell. No, not, not that Glenn Campbell. This Glenn Campbell's got an extra N. Before we get into this, welcome to Tryon Maiden. My name is Tryon, and if you like what you see, make sure you like and subscribe, or else- A holy war will spread across the galaxy in your name, like unquenchable fire! A WAR IN YOUR NAME! So without further ado, let's take a trip to Planet Dune. This movie opens with a group of researchers gathering readings on the planet aptly named... Planet Dune. Real creative. While they gather readings or do something sciency, we see sandworms rummaging through the ground, and just as the researchers begin to pack up, they get attacked and eaten by said worms. It's like the writers thought that the only thing that made Dune iconic was the giant worms, and none of the great houses drama, the ambiguous nature of Paul Atreides, the in-depth lore and world building surrounding the Fremen. Nope, worms. Damn, that title. What's that? Two seconds in a text box? 16 point impact font? No stroke? After this, we are introduced to two of our main characters, Astrid Young and Captain Chase, who is played by Sean Young, who you may know as Rachel from Blade Runner. She was also Chani in the original 1980s Dune movie. Not kidding, they got one of the OGs on this thing. Anyway, as Astrid goes on this rescue mission, she comes across this crashing Russian satellite where a cosmonaut is about to die from lack of oxygen. Command tells Astrid to disregard human life and just save the ship, but Astrid, being a rational, empathetic human being with any sense in the world, decides to save the dying man from, well, dying. Astrid returns to the command center where Captain Chase reprimands her for doing her job. We are not fighter pilots. And as a rescue flight division... Rescue people? I mean, she complains about some kind of KGB nonsense military treaties where American and Russian astronauts can't interact with each other. Which maybe would have been good to let your audience know about at the beginning of this movie? I swear, man, this scene is just basically setting up I'm the anti-establishment sci-fi good guy, and I'm the evil authoritarian antagonist. Watch in awe as we clash over our differing ideals. Anyway, rather than getting locked up, Astrid requests to be sent to a forced labor camp, which consists of locating freighters on Planet Dune. Before we travel to the planet, we meet Astrid's new crew, and she clashes with them immediately. We meet the ship's mechanic, who goes unnamed for this scene, but is named Rebecca, the navigator Ronnie, who has a garage door opener tied to her ankle, and Brad, the lazy, wisecracking crew member stereotype. That stuck eye on stick it? He <laughs> He just did an innuendo. As they leave for Planet Dune, Astrid decides that she's not drunk enough to operate heavy machinery, and they run into asteroids, which is purely there for extra drama and has no weight or bearing on anything. You better check yourself, civilian. We got a long road to walk together. That's, that's some grade A scripting right there. Free range, farm fresh okay. script. Mm -hmm. They go to Planet Dune, where the freighter is, only to discover that it was dragged like a few feet away from where it was supposed to be, looking totally abandoned. Maybe some of your Russian friends showed up to lend a hand. Damn, Rebecca! Must have graduated top of your class at Hater Academy. This whole scene is just the crew arguing, attempting to set up drama that will presumably get resolved later. It doesn't. Astrid drops her flask, claiming it's a family heirloom to the disgust and shock of the entire crew, who look like they have never seen alcohol before in their life. They continue arguing, expressing their worry about the dropping oxygen levels due to the active volcano on planet Dune, when out of left field, a worm shows up to attack them. They escape into a nearby cave where they find one of the survivors from the abandoned ship. This guy's name is Harley, and he's injured from escaping the worm. Right when they get out, Astrid distracts the worm, Brad stays behind with Harley, who passed out in the cave from injuries, and Ronnie and Rebecca go back for their first ship. 
While Astrid runs away, she finds another survivor from the abandoned freighter, Marilyn. She lets Astrid know that there are more than one worm because she can somehow tell all of these cheap CGI assets apart. She explains that a worm attacked her freighter and that the worms are attracted by the iron and human blood. Naturally, because she's rational, Astrid gives this thirsty, starving woman moonshine and explains that her family were moonshiners tracing back to Prohibition, which is a weird detail to have in a sci-fi movie that means absolutely nothing. Marilyn and Astrid run to the ship, and we cut to Ronnie and Rebecca? Why not the characters we were just with? Anyway, Rebecca explains that she's here to collect the ship that just so happens to be worth $300 billion, and that she'd pocket 100 mil if they get it out in one piece. She gets Ronnie to agree with the deal, and as Ronnie tries to fix the ship, a worm gets in. Rebecca goes out to also try to fix the ship, where she gets attacked by a worm. She somehow fends it off with a crowbar, and then she kills it using a severed power line. Ronnie shows up and said that she killed her worm off screen. Off screen! Ronnie expresses concern for the others, but top of the hater leaderboard, Rebecca says that she's gonna leave everyone behind. They make it back here? Great. If not, are we clear on this? Oh uh, no, we are in fact not. You did not finish what you said. Astrid tends to Marilyn's wounds and radios Space Force, where Captain Chase can't act. Is this a Russian incursion? Why is it always about the Russians? Captain Chase says that she can't send aid because she is the most comically uncaring person in existence. However, in a complete 180, Captain Chase requests to her superior to send a retrieval team to Planet Dune, even though she just said she couldn't do it. What is going on, man? I don't... I don't know what to think no more, man! I don't know what to think! Anyway, she gets denied because the crew is expendable and we are evil authoritarian force. We cut back to Brad and Harley, the latter of which was definitely not drunk during filming. I was dreaming about my Hawaiian honeymoon with my girl Marilyn. We've been planning it for a while. In an effort to escape the cave due to the rising CO2 levels, Brad tries to lower Harley through a conveniently placed hole in the ground, where a worm conveniently starts to climb up. The worm just stops chasing them, and Brad creates an air vent to stop them from suffocating, and they actually pull a smart maneuver and decide to grapple through it instead. That is the only compliment I will be giving this movie. They start to ride a worm back to the freighter. They lose control of the worm, and Rebecca gets eaten. Brad uses the landing gear to kill the worm, and they walk around looking for Astrid. Astrid and Marilyn talk about the worms and explain the same thing that they already knew. The worms are attracted to iron and such. They devise a plan to make a bomb to take down the worms and get off Planet Dune once and for all. We get a quick Breaking Bad cooking montage. They escape to the ship, where they literally find the mother of all sandworms. And as they try to take off, the mother worm attacks, where Astrid pulls out the last resort. The final strategy in this twisted gate. It's a gun. A, a normal handgun. That's her plan. She had it the entire time and didn't use it. Of course it doesn't work, so her actual plan is blowing up the ship to kill the worm. They all start dying, Astrid has an existential crisis, maybe the bad guys are right, boo hoo, and they decide to regroup with their crew from before. But boom, worm. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Right before they die, Captain Chase serendipitously shows up and rescues Astrid and the crew, breaking the rules that she enforced because characters need to change at the drop of a hat. Still, because they gotta reach that feature-length runtime, a worm yet again attacks their ship, preventing them from escape, Astrid drops a bomb again, Chase gets knocked the hell out, Astrid supercharges the thrusters so that way they can escape, and they escape, flying straight into a volcano for some reason. They narrowly escape the volcanic eruption that happens from out of nowhere, and everyone, except Rebecca, escapes from Planet Doom. Cut to black. That's all the closure. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. If I were to describe Planet Dune in a single word, it would be this. No. Now I won't go in too hard on this movie since the studio is known for making horrible movies like this, so I got what I paid for. But still, this movie does so much wrong. The CGI is terrible, the color grading puts Netflix's depictions of Mexico to shame, the acting is legitimately the worst I have ever seen. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling it, this is the worst acting I have ever seen. The story is paper thin and it made as little sense writing it out for this video as it did while watching the movie. I'm so sorry if this video made no sense to you. It made 
none to me either, and I made it. I forgot everything about Planet Dune after the first time I watched it back in 2021, and I will inevitably forget everything about it after this watch through three years later. It is legitimately one of the most irredeemably bad movies I have ever seen, and I love it to pieces. I wanted to thank each and every one of you for watching. This has been Tryin' Maiden, I've been Tryin', and I'll see y'all next week. Peace!